Scott Shanahan was missing, and quite frankly, for almost a year, no one seemed to care. When asked about his whereabouts, Scott's wife Dixie told those who asked that Scott had run off with another woman. The police had their doubts and would soon discover the shocking secret behind Scott's disappearance. Dixie Schreiber was born in Muscatine, Iowa in 1967. Dixie's father died when she was very young. In 1976, her mother married Frank Street, who sexually abused Dixie and her sister for years until Dixie threatened to report the abuse to the police. In 1983, when Dixie was still in high school, she met 20-year-old Scott Shanahan. They started dating, and in 1984, when her family moved to Texas, Dixie decided to move to Defiance, Iowa, a small town with, at that time, just over 300 people to live with Scott's parents. Both of Scott's parents suffered from physical disabilities. His mother, Beverly, had a heart condition and had undergone triple bypass surgery. Dixie cared for them and developed a close, loving relationship with them. Dixie said that Beverly was more like a mother to her than her mother. After graduating from high school in 1986, Dixie found a warehouse job in Harlan and Scott, a mechanic, stayed at home working on cars and farm equipment. Neighbours described Scott as having one hell of a temper, as they often heard him throwing wrenches around if things weren't going his way. From the beginning of their relationship, Scott verbally and physically abused Dixie. Although Dixie described this as minor compared to what she would later experience, In those early years, Scott was already beating her so severely she would often have bruises up and down her body. On one occasion, in 1986, Scott beat Dixie for visiting her family, whom she had not seen since she moved in with him in 1984. However, Dixie was not his only victim. Despite Scott's mum having had triple bypass surgery, he also physically abused his mother. In 1988, Scott's mother developed pneumonia after attending her brother-in-law's funeral. Instead of Scott caring for his mother, he reacted by beating her so severely that she was covered from head to toe in bruises. Scott was beating both his mother and Dixie at least twice a week. Despite the beatings, his mother made Dixie promise that should anything happen to her, Dixie would take care of Scott. The violence escalated and the beatings worsened, especially when Scott experienced some misfortune, such as his mother's sickness and the death of his grandfather. In 1994, when his mother died, Scott went off the wall, beating Dixie more frequently. When his mother died, she left him the house and a $150,000 inheritance. After more than a decade together, in 1985, Scott proposed to Dixie. Shortly after the wedding, Dixie took a job in a nearby nursing home, and it was there that after Dixie became pregnant in late 1995, her colleagues and friends noticed signs of abuse. After the birth of their son Zachary in 1996, the abuse worsened. He took over her life and wouldn't allow her to have friends, and on one occasion, beat her for waving at a friend. On the 31st of May 1997, whilst driving home, Scott yelled, punched and beat Dixie and eventually kicked her out of the car. Dixie walked to a payphone and called a co-worker, who advised her to call the police. Scott was sentenced to two days in jail and was to have no contact with Dixie. However, Dixie wrote to the judge to request the restraining order to be lifted, something she would often do. Scott was released. The beatings continued. 
he would throw her down the stairs, chipping her front tooth, stick her head down the toilet whilst her children watched. He hit her in the head with cowboy boots, poked her in the eye, causing it to bleed, smashed her head into doors. He would bite her, throw tools in her face, causing her to have a black eye. He ran over her legs with a lawnmower. He once smashed a plate of mashed potatoes over her head because the mashed potatoes were too runny. And on three occasions, Scott tied Dixie up in the basement for days, not allowing her to use the bathroom and said, you know I could just let you sit here and die and nobody would know the difference. In September 1997, Dixie once again called the police. Scott was arrested and served only four days in jail. Again, Dixie gave Scott another chance and in 1998, Scott and Dixie had a daughter whom they named Ashley. In October 2000, the Shelby County Sheriff's Department received a disturbing call. When the police arrived, they found Scott had held Dixie captive in the dark for three days. He had used coat hangers to bind her hands and feet and threw her in the basement. The police arrested Scott. He was charged with false imprisonment, a felony offence which could result in years in prison. This time, Dixie decided not to write to the judge. Instead, she moved with her kids to Texas and reunited with her family. However, Dixie chose not to testify and Scott was released. He immediately traveled to Texas, taking Dixie and the kids back to Iowa. By August 2002, Dixie was physically abused three to four times weekly. She discovered that once again, she was pregnant. When she told Scott, he was filled with rage and ordered her to have an abortion. Dixie refused. Scott repeatedly beat Dixie and said he would make sure she would not have the baby and that there was nothing she could do about it. On the 30th of August 2002, Dixie woke up around 6.30am. She sent Zachary to school while Scott was still asleep. When Scott woke up, he was enraged because Dixie didn't wake him up before Zachary left. He pulled Dixie by her hair and beat her in the stomach, screaming that he would kill the unborn child one way or another, all while their daughter, Ashley, watched. Dixie sent Ashley to a friend's house nearby. She tried to leave the house, but Scott followed her, took her car keys, knocked her to the ground and dragged her by the hair into the house, pulling chunks of hair out of her head. He punched her in the stomach again, screaming that she was not having the baby. While Dixie lay on the floor crying, Scott went into the other room and returned with a shotgun. He was in a rage, physically shaking and calling her names. He put two different shells in the gun and pointed the gun at her and said, This day is not over. I will kill you. Scott eventually walked away, but he wasn't done. As Dixie sat in the living room chair, he returned in a rage and beat her again, threatening her and the unborn baby's life. When he eventually stopped beating Dixie, Scott removed all the phones from the sockets and went into the bedroom to lie down, taking the phones with him. The only working phone was in the bedroom with Scott. Dixie wanted to call the police and went into the bedroom to try and use the phone. As she tried to grab the phone, Scott moved towards her. The shotgun was near the phone. Dixie grabbed it, closed her eyes and shot Scott. She then sat in a chair for a few hours 
wondering what she was going to do. Still unsure what to do, Dixie returned to the bedroom, pulled up the sheets to cover the body, retrieved the phone and the gun, shut the bedroom door, put a towel underneath it and put the gun in the children's bedroom closet. Scott didn't associate with people in town. They were used to not seeing him around for weeks. The few people that noticed Scott was missing really didn't give a shit and didn't look for him, as they knew how he treated Dixie and thought, good riddance, she was better off without him. When anyone would ask Dixie where Scott was, she told them he wasn't happy that she was pregnant again and left her for another woman. On the 1st of March 2003, Dixie gave birth to her daughter Brittany. Dixie and the kids' lives were changing for the better. The kids could now play outside and ride their bikes around town. Dixie was out more often and eventually found herself in a new relationship with factory worker Jeff Duty, who would stay at the house on weekends. Even though Scott wasn't well-liked, seeing another man in the house that Scott grew up in, which he inherited after his mother's death, caused some people to doubt Scott's disappearance. People started asking more questions when Dixie started selling Scott's belongings, such as tools, cars and tractors. Everyone knew how Scott felt about his belongings and knew that he would never allow that to happen. Something wasn't making sense. Finally, in 2003, a formal inquiry was made regarding the missing Scott Shanahan. Police started to do background checks on Scott around 50 states. However, they could not find any employment records. It seemed as if Scott had fallen off the face of the earth. On the 22nd of July 2003, Deputy John Kelly arrived at Dixie's house and asked about Scott's whereabouts. Dixie told the sheriff that Scott had moved to Atlantic, Iowa and was possibly involved in drug activity. Police continued their search for Scott with no luck. On the morning of the 20th of October 2003, the sheriff deputy brought Dixie to the station. The police questioned Dixie, but she became defensive and unwilling to talk. However, Dixie's secret was about to be revealed as the police had obtained a warrant to search Dixie's house. On his way, the sheriff dropped Dixie off at her friend's house. Before entering the house, Dixie told the sheriff that this is where she would be once the search of her home was over. The police entered Dixie's house and immediately identified the awful smell. It was a smell of death. They walked through the home towards the back bedroom the door was closed with a scented candle at the front of the door and a rolled up towel placed at the bottom of the door. Officers opened the door and were completely overwhelmed by the smell. They looked around the room and saw a lump in the middle of the bed. The officers pulled the covers back and discovered Scott's decomposed body covered in maggots and other insects that had eaten parts of the flesh. However, it was clear to the police that Scott had died from a gunshot wound to the back of his head, which the medical examiner's office later confirmed. Scott had remained in the bedroom for 14 months while Dixie and her children continued to live in the home. The police officers drove back to the house where Dixie was and arrested her. However, she wasn't in jail for long. The town knew Dixie's story. They understood what Dixie had gone through and thought Scott got what he deserved. The town raised $15,000 to pay for Dixie's bail. Only four people attended Scott's funeral. His relatives declined to pay for the service. 
Although Dixie admitted to shooting Scott, she pled not guilty to murder on the grounds of self-defence. She turned down a plea bargain on a lesser charge, hoping for a full acquittal at trial. Taking the plea bargain would have meant a maximum sentence of 10 years, possibly serving two to three years. On the 9th of April 2004, she married her boyfriend Jeff Duty at the Shelby County Courthouse. She would stand trial for murder in the same courthouse two weeks later. Prosecutors acknowledged Dixie had been abused, but said the reason she killed Scott was to do with money. Prosecutors argued that Scott's inheritance money of $150,000 was gone, and she also wanted Scott gone, and she shot Scott in cold blood in the back of the head whilst he was asleep. Dixie's attorney argued that Scott was out of control, especially when Dixie became pregnant with their third child. Dixie took the stand. On cross-examination, prosecutors disputed Dixie's versions of events and argued that if it was self-defence, she would have called the police. Instead, she pretended Scott was still alive for over a year and even fraudulently signed his name on checks after his death. On the 29th of April, after seven hours of deliberation, the jury reached a verdict of second-degree murder. However, the jury were unaware that second-degree murder in Iowa carries a 50-year sentence with a mandatory of 35 years served before parole can be considered. One juror cried as she thought Dixie might be sentenced to 25 years and possibly serve only eight. Governor Tom Valsack intervened and lowered her sentence to a minimum of 10 years in prison. At the time, Valsack said Scott Shanahan's abuse of Dixie was a contributing factor in the unfortunate series of events. On the 28th of July, 2006, the parole board denied Dixie's request for clemency. Dixie wanted her new husband, Jeffrey Duty, to be recognised as a father of her children while she served her time in prison. However, the juvenile court denied him custody, saying he hadn't been with the children long enough and had neglected his own children and had a criminal record. Dixie's sister took custody of her three children and took them to live with her in Texas. In 2018, after nearly 14 years in prison, Dixie Shanahan Duty was granted work release by the Iowa Board of Parole and finally allowed to go home. Thanks so much for watching. Remember to subscribe, like and comment and I will see you in the next video.